Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the joint meeting of the Edgecombe County Board of Education and the Edgecombe County Board of Commissioners as we meet today, May 31st, 2022. I call the meeting of the Edgecombe County Board of Education to order. Let me say first that board member Kent is absent because she's in physical therapy because of recent surgery. She wishes us well, and uh, this is important to her, for her, but she's unable to be here. I will begin with introductions, if you will, as, uh, and go around the table as we present and introduce ourselves. My name is Raymond Privet. I serve as chair and district six. citizens of Uvalda, Texas, and Rob Elementary School prepared to bury the uh, 19 students and two staff members who were senseless to kill. Let us stand in a moment of silence and kill. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Um, we're certainly going to, we have quite much to cover. We're going to move through that as expeditiously as we can so that you have ample opportunity to be able to, uh, to have open discussion, ask questions. Uh, I want to say um, that uh, on behalf to the board, the school board, I want to say what a pleasure it has been to work with Dr. Bridges and her staff. Obviously, on this issue has brought us together uh, more frequently than most other times, but um, you've got a great team here. We certainly uh, are honored to be able to work with you, and thank you. So tonight, you're going to see not two separate presentations, but one presentation. I'll open it up here, and then you'll see it again here at the end. Uh, so the, um, for So just to quickly review the agenda tonight, um, the, the purpose of the meeting is to give you an update on our community meetings and other information that's been gathered, but in particular have this time allotted so that you, call, you all can discuss this possible transition. You'll see we will, uh, staff will cover the community meetings that we've had, the 
survey that has uh, been available for some time and still available. Um, there were questions that were received of, of our board that um, were submitted to Dr. Bridges and her team. They'll be answering those questions very specifically and directly. Then uh, I'll come back at the end and talk about financial considerations, in particular the amount of money that the county has been sending uh, to Nash County Schools, and then we'll give you opportunity for open discussion. So at this point, to talk about our community meetings, I'd like to invite Mr. Donnell Cannon to come. Good evening, everyone. I just wanted to uh, quickly give you an overview of the community meetings that we held uh, over the last month. So our first meeting was held May 3rd at Ebenezer Baptist Church. It was from 5 to 6.30 p.m. We had about approximately 50 participants at that, at that meeting um, with a broad collection of stakeholders. Our, meeting, our second meeting was held May 10th at the Rocky Mountain Event Center from 5 to 6.30 p.m. And we had approximately 40 participants. Um, and our meeting, the third meeting was held uh, May 18th um, at the ECC's Rocky Mountain Campus from 5 to 6.30 p.m. We had approximately 40 participants. We also have a significant number of folks here that are in the room. We did not count um, our board members, our, our, uh, our district staff as part in this number. So this number only includes uh, our participants, which by community members, parents, uh, or young people. I just want to kind of like um, pull you closer to some of our key takeaways from those meetings. And so we, we wanted to have a format in which it allowed uh, some intimate discussion it's an intimate exchange, so folks can ask the sorts of questions that they were holding on to, and also like feel, feel, feel really seen. So we decided to go with a small group discussion, so we set the meeting off with um, just a, a reverend primate, like introducing introduce the space, inviting folks to the space, um, gathering, uh, helping, helping folks understand like, while we're in the space together, going through an agenda. Then we um, Eric, uh, Eric Evans entered, and he shared, shared a little high-level historical context of the demerger. We realized that a number of folks still have questions regarding um, the demerger itself, the, the, uh, the Senate bill, and, and, and other, other um, questions that they had. And so the doctor we followed with just kind of like a, a, a high level view of our district, like what we're up to, our innovative practices that have taken root, and um, how we're thinking about a possible demerger. And then I, I transitioned to the conversation, in which I was kind of shared some of the ideas we had some of the processes we were taking in terms of um, pulling families closer to the emergency decisions and kind of what our work had looked like long term and where we might be headed um, going forward. So these were the, the three big questions that each table facilitator had. So we tried to break the groups up into about like 10 to 15 um, so that everyone could have a chance to share a voice. And so each facilitator had some discussion, a set of discussion questions. So we thought these were the most significant questions that would draw the, the, large, the largest sets of insights. So we asked one, like, are, are you in favor of the emerger? Why are we not? We wanted to ask that question very directly. That's the first question, given that that was the most important information that we needed to, to kind of guide, uh, guide the board in making the decision. And then we had, well, what, what was the question that you have regarding the emerger? So that someone at the table could answer those questions or could point them to a direction where they could find answers to those questions. And then our third question is, what would you want our commissioners to know as it relates to the emerger? Again, so that folks have space where they could share like, what, how, what they were thinking about how they're thinking about it, our emotions that are holding on to, but those can be captured in space. We then at each table facilitator just kind of share loudly to some of the big takeaways and big insights at each table so that folks could hear just the source of conversation, the source of chatter that was happening at the conversations. And then we're allowed some QA um, so we can directly answer some of the questions that um, some of our participants have. So here's some of our, our big insights. So um, essentially, at each of our table facilitators submitted their questions. We're able to pull them together, and anything that came up more than twice, we wanted to capture that as an insight. So here are some things that we that, that came up quite frequently. So did, um, so they did not experience significant. We did not experience significant opposition within those spaces. Um, many people are still determining where they stand on the issue. Again, we, we realized that a lot of folks were coming to those spaces to learn more about the merger, hadn't heard about it, and needed direction in terms of where they might find information. So uh, Mr. Evans, this presentation, um, giving a historical context, was really really helpful in helping people kind of. Um, like to take a stance or like kind of find their way in this, in this issue. To so realize that the community wants to preserve the, the, the care feeder pattern, you're going to see that come up multiple times also in the survey results. Uh, so parents and uh, young people really want to 
uh, maintain their care feeder packet. So they don't want to be dispersed across like Antoine County public schools, uh, actually schools, if uh, you merge your to take place. Also, they, uh, they're, they want an inclusive decision making uh, process. So they want to be really heard throughout this process. So they don't want the decisions to be made arbitrarily without um, their voices being, um, being, being elevated. And so regardless of the decision, parents just want their, their uh, children to be cared for. So we found out that a lot of parents, like whether like a transition happens or it doesn't, they really just want their kid to get the types of education experiences they deserve. Uh, so whether kids are being stay in Nash or come over to Nash home, they deserve better and want better. And then there's a deep curiosity around like how this happens, when a new version will take place, where students will go, and what experiences students, students will have. So there's a significant number of questions about some of the nuances. Um, some of them we had to find, and some of them obviously we don't have we didn't have answers to. But um, just having a place where they can share those like, um, those questions, I felt really important to, to to our stakeholders. So we launched our our survey results. Each of you should have a two pager on at your desk, and the two pager is something we were able to kind of use um, as like, to, to to kind of capture the meeting dates and also like elevate the survey. So we. We're able to push that out, out to the community. And okay, so Rose is coming around now with the with the surveys. However, if you were to use your phone and click the QR codes, you also have access to the surveys, but in just a second we'll do a deep dive in terms of like what sorts of questions on the survey and what we heard from the survey. So again, directly after our last meeting, we launched the survey, we launched the survey and we were able to uh, so we're able to distribute those through like community canvassing. So we went door to door, we placed them in like, the significant community hubs, we hung them up on the, on the windows, we put them at the countertops to try to find places where, where the community, uh, the East Rock community frequent most, and we wanted to place the surveys in those particular areas so that the like, folks had access to them. And um, so we posted on our social media pages, we posted on our ECPS website, Megaphone through our design team, we have a design team that meets that kind of gives feedback on some of the big ideas that we're, that we're holding. And so those folks serve as like some of our key stakeholders in, in pushing that information out. Um, we've been able to, to partner with a few community activists who've been sharing that across their social media sites, which has been really helpful in gathering some feedback. And um, we will email, like, email all the surveys to anyone we've had empathy interviews with. So like, today we had about 140 empathy interviews. So anyone that we've met with, we just sent that right back out to them and asked them to share that widely. Again, we're trying to connect with as many people as we could. And then our community meetings, we had a significant number of flyers available that folks could take out with them. We asked folks to, we encouraged folks to take the, to take the survey and to share, share that survey out within the community. So, so about the survey. So we partnered with our friends at, um, at NC. We're using the Reach NC Voices as a messaging tool that um, helps connect um, our, our, our school district with those who would be most impacted by the deep merger. So the, the survey will take about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, we use a bunch of conditioning questioning, questioning based on like, personal characteristics. So parents had a, a separate set of questions. Our students had a separate set of questions. Our alumni had a separate set, and our educators and our community members. So based on like your, um, you know, your profile, your demographic, they led you down a different pathway, so that we could gather some significant information from that particular population. So the question is about twenty. It's about twenty-two questions on the survey. We've got a number of like different choices. We had like drop down. We have um, uh, choice questions, ranking, and open ended. So six questions are like are demographics. We, so if you take some so track that's this opening, some opening question that helps us like determine the user profile. And then it allows only one entry per IP address. So you can't enter multiple, they have to serve multiple survey entries from the same IP address. So it would require you, if you want to enter multiple times, it would require you to use multiple um, separate devices. So here's just some overall results from, from the survey. So we have about 1,600 uh, views. We have about 113 participants, as you can see, a, we have a number of people who are opening the survey, but they aren't completing the survey. So we're trying to land our feet there and figure out like, why that is and how we gain some traction. Um, Mr. Evans and I, we, want, we pushed out a video the other day where we were interviewed by um, Eric Phillips, who's an eighth grader at, at um, West Edgecombe Middle School, just trying to share some information regarding the survey, regarding the merger, and all the nuances of that, and questions that folks held, just as an innovative way to try and get this messaging out to parents. Um, we have about 60, no, 13, uh, 310 comments, and you'll, some of that it will be in your packet as well. Uh, we have about um, 63 of, of respondents are parents, or students, their mom, or the educators, or the community members. We have 53% of respondents live in Edmond County, and 47% live in Nash County. 
42% of respondents are parents, and 25% are educators, 19% are alumni, and we have 9% of community members, 5% of our young people. And the 60% of the educators that work in Baskerville Elementary School, and the 38% of those participants are aware of the demerger, and they're 19% who share that they are, um, they're not at all aware of the demerger. You have some of the like, commentary, some of the anecdotes within like a, a, a two-page packet, we wanted to pull out some of these key graphics to kind of share uh, some of these big nuggets, like how like what folks are thinking about and how they're uh, sharing that with us. So we have the first 63% of them um, believe students should remain in their neighborhood schools. Um, so as you can see, we folks are like want to remain in their care like feeder patterns. So then we also ask them, what are the greatest two to three challenges that schools in East Rocky Mountain face? And here's some of the some of those insights that came up multiple times. Um, so they want better academic programs. And, um, this is a quote, but this quote came up quite, quite frequently. But there's disproportionate funding and resources to say that have been a concern. And then there's low academic achievement. That came up multiple times. I think we saw that like frequently the most. Frequently, uh, that's why the most. And then teacher retention was a huge one. So it's like one thing that's on, that's on uh, the minds of those in East Park now. And inadequate facilities, and then uh, our, our children deserve a better chance. So we heard that a lot. But I can't, they just want better as you can imagine, 100% of the respondents want to be a part of, of this decision-making process. A significant number of, uh, of respondents express that they would love to be a part of that, um, a part of the decision-making process via a survey. And then, so our, we asked the question directly in the survey, are you in favor of the demerger? Um, are, um, are you in favor of demerger? We have 57% that said they are not in favor of demerger which is about 21 participants. We have 30% who are about 11 who said they are in favor of the demerger. And then we have 14% who, who don't have a preference. Now it's important to note here that like 33%, which are 30, 37 people, only respond to the question. So we had about 37 respondents out of 113. So um, one shift we made to the survey was move this question directly to the top of the survey with hopes that that could um, give us a better pic pic picture of like what folks are asking. But again, that's, that's only 33% of the folks actually responding to this particular question. And if you uh, want to look at some of the survey results, there is a lot of feed. That's a bit neat at the very top of the two-pager. If you want to dive into that, you can see the, the feed like update every time someone like answers the survey results. I'll hand over that feed. transitional process happen. 
And, and as county commissioners, you all were, um, you granted us that. Uh, we had Mr. Cannon, he has the role of, of going out, canvassing the community, talking to people, finding out what are, are their concerns, and for us to, to begin to unpack those concerns. So again, as we start our 22-23 school year, um, let's just be clear that we want to, as a school system, of course, the county commissioners will make the vote, they will decide, we will follow suit. But as a school system, our job is to do what is best and what is right for any students that are either in Edgecombe County or become a part of the Edgecombe County Public Schools. So that, that is kind of the, the caveat for us as we open up um, and continue answering these questions. So those questions. There are quite a few, there are about 12. Some of us, different folks will come up and answer, but I'll start with, um, and we numbered them so that you can kind of follow along. Are there any students residing in Nash County who currently attend the four Rocky Mount schools and they're listed, they are located in Edgecombe? And yes, so there are approximately 319 students who reside in Nash County and attend one of the schools on the Edgecombe County side of Rocky Mount. Two, how many students may be grandfathered in to remain enrolled and graduate from Rocky Mountain High School? And there are 339 who are currently a part of Rocky Mountain High School, but there are 423 Edgecombe County students who are high school students who are still a part of Edgecombe County. So there are, four, there are 339 at Rocky Mountain Senior High School, there are 42 at Nash Central High School, three at Northern Nash, 18 at the Early College, 9 at Tar River Academy, and 12 that are at um, City High School. So 339 from Rocky Mount, but then there are about a little less than 100 who are spread throughout a number of schools in, in Rocky Mount. How many high school students do you anticipate will be absorbed in the current ECTS schools, and where will these students be assigned? And so when we're thinking about it, and that question specifically talked about high school students, and so we proposed a, a unique educational model. We shared that with you the last time we were together in regards to the merger. Um, and, and so we don't anticipate students having to go into the high schools, but that, that's an option. So this is one of the options, five micro schools, there's one hub, and it lists some of the other um, uh, amenities that were happening in the school. But then there could be students who decided they don't want this track and they would flush into our other high schools. And when we think about that, there's some mileage there. So each one of those schools, we just simply used DS Johnson as a point of location and we gave the mileage for the other three traditional high schools, 17 miles from North, um, 15 miles from Harbor High School, and 11 miles from South. And of course, students can also apply to the Edgecombe Early College, the campus that's um, in, in um, Okay. And then the next question four was, what is the farthest distance any school student would be bused? And again, current plan is for Rocky Mount Elementary and Middle School students to remain in their current assigned schools. And as you heard uh, Mr. Cannon share, that was a preference from parents and from others who have participated in the survey and been a part of the community meetings. So again, we shared the longest distance that a student could be transported would be the 17 miles. Um, and that was from north to DS Johnson. And here's mileage for the other schools in our district. And again, we used this a point DS Johnson. We didn't um, use any other point, we used DS Johnson. We placed all of our other schools, elementary, middle, and high school, when you see um, the variance um, in the mileage there. And then question five, will students currently attending the four schools in Edgecombe be absorbed and remain enrolled? And so again, survey results, family interviews, insights revealed that families want their children to remain in their current community schools. We'll make an effort to ensure elementary students remain in their current school. Those students will remain students who remain at Parker or transition. And there was a model that was shared um, for Mr. Cannon a couple meetings ago where there was a 7-8 model and then there was a 9 through 12 model. In question six, will any students currently attending ECTS schools be reassigned? And so 
Our, we do not anticipate that happening based on the model that we put together, um, based on the options that we provided. And here is um, the uh, occupancy and the capacity. We have two schools. Those are in the darker uh, bold, South Edge Home Middle and Southwest Edge Home High School. If you look at the far right, they are already over capacity. So those schools certainly could not um, be very difficult for them to absorb any additional students. And the number of parentheses is how many additional students each of the schools could, could um, capacity-wise, could, could afford to, to have to join them. Okay? But again, our intention is not to do that. I'll go back. We do not anticipate the assignment. That's, that's not the plan that we have in place. Okay. And then what is the comparison of current K-8 class sizes in ECPS? And schools ECPS may absorb. And this is what we were able to determine um, from our, our information from the General Assembly. And of course, this is what we have in ECPS. And then question eight rank schools ECPS may absorb in order from one with the most facility needs to the least. Good evening, everyone. Uh, um, so when we ranked these schools, we based it off of the 2016 facility needs survey. Um, but uh, as of Friday, I believe um, Mr. Shannon Davis, who was the maintenance director in uh, Nash, shared with us some capital improvements they've made since 2016. So um, we went back and adjusted our numbers. The first number was five million, but they've done about seven hundred thousand dollars worth of work um, since 2015. So as you look at those handouts, you'll see the actual detailed projects that they've done since 2015 up until 2019. Uh, mainly, uh, if you look at Johnson, was the, was the biggest one that they did the most HVAC work at. Which was, uh, the first project was two hundred twenty-nine thousand, and then the following year they did two hundred seven thousand. For a total of a little over half a million dollars worth of HVAC work at uh, Johnson, uh, Baskerville, and Parker. Um, the next one it is Baskerville, which is around $2.8 million worth of deferred maintenance on that building. Uh, then Parker um, is also at $2.2 million, and Fairview, um, which is at $450,000. Uh, again, we're not, we're not very sure what they're going to have on tap for this year, but they did share um, from 2015 up to 2019. Uh, the amount of work they've done. Uh, there's also some more capital projects, which is such things like changing out lights, uh, <coughs> asbestos abatement, um, changing carpet and classrooms, renovating locker rooms, um, exterior lights, and also some roofing projects. So this is just a snapshot of what they've done since 2015. I do not have the current numbers from 21 or 22 or anything going into this summer. So to get back again into it um, from what we had in 2016, so uh, any questions? I have not found that to be true, but I, I have not seen any documentation on that one. I do know that uh, Bastard on P.S. Johnson did have a lot of basement work that needed to be done. And when we toured the building uh, about two years ago, uh, Mr. Davis did, I mean, he did show me that, uh, that amount of work that needed to be done in the multi-purpose room. But I have not seen any reports from the other buildings. But we certainly could reach out and see if they do have any records that they would like that they can share with us. I have a question. Do you have an idea, just a ballpark off the top of your head, how much deferred maintenance is uh, on our books for Edgecombe County Schools throughout our entire county? Yes. Um, prior to COVID, we had about $14 million uh, of deferred maintenance between all of our buildings. So we made a significant dent in that, which we have about $9 million worth of work going on between now and the end of 2023. So we have about $10 million left, is what you're saying? Yes. Nine something. Yes, sir. And that right there is $10 million. Yes, yes, yes. So million. 10 million on those four and 10 million for all the other schools just outside of those four. Correct. Okay, 20 million. Yes, ma'am. So they kind of balance each other out. We've got just as much that needs to be done on Edgecombe and Edgecombe schools as needs to be done in these four schools on Hart and Outside. Yes. Okay. So the DS Johnson, now they pointed out to us when I went on the tour last Friday. About the roofing, is that part of the, at, 
if it's not on this, I, I can't say. And it, I'm not saying he, he didn't leave anything off. This only goes up to 2019. But it wasn't shared with us at this point. But we can certainly reach out and see just to verify. Okay, I, mean, I saw the group. Sure. They did the stages that I wanted. Did it say what year? Okay, it ended it last year. Last year. Okay, so we get this. Okay, this is only up here in 2019. Of education for all four of our new schools. 
Um, those schools are currently not in restart status, but we know that restart does give us some flexibility that has helped us do some of the innovative work that we've been able to do here in Edgecombe, uh, certainly at North and at Phillips, you've seen the results of that. Uh, those flexibilities are things like budget, curriculum, licensure, and calendar flexibility, and so that helps us um, really make sure that we're meeting the needs of every single student. And then, of course, redesign work takes human capital and it takes additional dollars as well, and so those are two pieces that we would really need to think about as we move into um, to the work of really uh, increasing the quality of education at those schools. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Myron. Good evening. So in addition to what Ms. Swanson was just talking about, um, our curriculum and instruction, when we talk about additional intervention support for the students, um, this will be that additional help that they need outside of what will be done in the traditional classroom setting. Additional excellent teachers and tutors, uh, we would need those tutors and teachers to support the innovative work as you just mentioned. Also, looking at the school and district support staff with track records of success, we talk about instructional coaches and multi-classroom leaders. Those are staff members who have a proven track record of having high uh, performance scores um, over the course of several years. And then additional funding for training and development of new staff just to bring them up to speed on some of the things that we're doing in our district um, currently.
would have to go through uh, the application and the interviewing process. And so that could create a potential obstacle. Um, we also look at uh, when we're hiring additional staff, the cultural integration. They're accustomed to doing business one way uh, in Nash Public Schools, but coming to Edgecombe County, we have a strategic plan that, is, that sets our vision, our mission for the district, as well as our priorities. And so making sure that as new people join us, they are acclimated to the work that we're doing in NECPX. Just by way of information, uh, again, as another potential area, currently the teacher supplement in Edgecombe County is 7%. We know that the supplement is the amount that's given by the LEA above the state salary as set forth in the state salary schedule. But in Nash, their current base supplement is 10%. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll notice that in Nash, the teacher supplement increases by their degrees, whether it's a master's degree, an advanced degree, or a doctorate. And right now, there are conversations about raising the base supplement to 11%. And so when you look at the example uh, set before you, a teacher with a salary of $45,000 from the state salary schedule, in ECPS, they would have a supplement of $3,150. While as a NASH employee, that supplement, based on the 11% that's being discussed now, will be 4950 And so while that may or may not seem like a lot of money um, to those of us who are in the room, it could be a decision, decision factor when staff is deciding whether or not they want to join uh, Edgecombe County Public Schools should the demerger take place. So just a few things with the HR. I have questions. Have, you, have we put a dollar figure? I mean, I know it's per, how many students? I mean, what would be the total additional cost no. based on the number of teachers you would require? Right, so we don't have a specific dollar figure for that yet uh, because we would go back and look at uh, the projected number of students, the allotment formula from the state, and then come up with some dollar figures. And I would assume we need to go ahead and, and potentially look at 11% for all Edgecombe right. County teachers everywhere. So it's not just the ones that may come right. to work for us. Certainly. Thank you. Right. So we don't that Edgecombe County now is covering, used to be covered by the city, right? I'm sorry, that's
Hospitals are going to be the most expensive because of all the programs and the different um, uh, areas you have to encompass. Um, so right now, in 2020, the average was $43 million for a 369,000 square foot building. Of course, with inflation, everything's going through the roof, so you can add about another 10 to 12 percent to that number. So, if you look at the cost breakdown for a new hospital, which we're just talking about, the post office office. Uh, first off, self health gave us an estimate, which is a turnkey job. This, these are their numbers uh, of 7.75 million, which would, in, which would also include us purchasing the old post office building, them doing all the design fees, all the engineering. It's basically a turnkey job. So this number was given to us, I think, about a year ago. By the beginning. So you can also add some inflation to that, but this is just an estimate that's giving us something to work off of. Were that whole 423 high school students, the post office? I, I think mean, yes, but it, I don't think they'll be there all at one time, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so based on the, uh, the innovative model that we presented, so students would have multiple health downtown. So this would just be the place for kids, right? The advisory would be the place for kids would like more. So that's the cost of just one building. Just one, and one, how many buildings are you considering? So we would have the ECC Urban College that's uh, that's in the General Assembly, so kids walk across the street there, and then we have like, a few other buildings that we're identifying. A few like, others. Yeah, right. so not purchasing, but what students would go over there for the passion experience. If, if we don't purchase it, how are they going to go to school in another building? So we, we asked for the support of our friends over in Rocky Mountain State. So for an example, a student might take in the art micro school at the Booker T. Washington Center. Or a student will spend like once or twice a week at that particular center. The other time, students would be out in their, out in their internships. So instead of spending like 60% of their time within the internships would, uh, throughout like Rocky Mountain. So that's what the experience would happen. So we're just like reimagining what brick and mortar school looks like and how do we best prepare but we're talking about spending eight and a half million dollars on a building that will not hold all 423 students, correct? Potentially. Again, it's 19,000 square feet. Uh, we have 423 kids. Okay. It, it could, it could, it could. Yes. Now, I've heard that this building has a structure as well. Yes. But that's factored into the design. Uh, as far as like the construction of the building, whatever renovation would make, the abatement would take place is included in the 7.75. So eight, I mean, you're saying add 10% to that. So that's well, number, to the 10 to 12. Yes. So that's $8.5 million for a building that may not hold all 423 and add the $10 million to the, for the other schools. So we're talking about $18.5 million right now. Just the capital to get up and start, not counting the ongoing cost. Okay. But well, then the second option is the 15 to 20 year lease at $275,000. And that does include the renovations of the building, but we will not own that building after the lease is up, which is roughly uh, five and a half million, what would be the term of the lease if we go 20 years. Um, again, these numbers could go up if we decide to do it because of inflation, but this is just to give us a ballpark of where to start what we're looking at if we were to go with the post office or the first um, option versus the lease. I have a question. Sorry. I heard you talking about other places in Rocky I thought the gentleman coming to Rocky Mount out of college was out of education. I think his response was not Rocky Mount being in education, but also that they need to use General Statton's statute that is fair that would allow citizens to do a lot of do other things than what happened when the Senate Bill 392 passed. So there are different uh, statutes that we might be dealing with to get assistance from the city of Rocky Mount. He's not talking about the city of being in Rocky Mount. He's talking about educating the children in the city of Rocky Mountain. Yeah, yeah. He was talking about the Booker T. Theater of us using that as an, as an educational site. The theater that's right there on uh, uh, Tunnel Street. And they just have the educational facilities. They do not have to be educated. Uh, what we're talking about here is, is something that I think this side of the room will make a decision on in terms of where they cite those children, how they use those buildings. Okay, I think that's what we're talking about. It does not have to be an edge home on building. It has to be some type of agreement, at least agreement, or arrangement that the school board makes with the city or private individuals for the use of their building. And I think we're talking about uh, an innovative approach that can be presented to in the community meetings that some of us saw and some of us didn't see, okay, as it relates to the approach that it appears that the school board 
uh, as a willingness to do it. These are some of the things that they're already doing in some of the schools that are in already probably in our county. That's what I think that they're, they're talking about. And I think that the concerns that, uh, that the things that we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the, the dollars here. And, uh, and I think from where I've been coming from is we're talking about uh, uh, for uh, Schools over there that have been uh, a failing uh, the capital needs that have not been met and have been stated to us by uh, many on the board over there that will not be met. So if our board does not give serious consideration, these schools will continue to deteriorate because they've already stated and if, if we did this five years down, these schools would be in worse condition. Okay, because uh, because the, the capital improvement that's needed is not one of those schools. And I think those are the things that, that we need to consider. And as I've stated many times, uh, these are children that I'm going to consider right now in nobody's name. Uh, their uh, health education, welfare, kind of responsibility. And the failure of these kids, I'm not going to finish on anybody right now but us, those of us here, because we have an opportunity here to say that we are going to assume the education of these children that are in our county. And to do less than that, we have failed. Go ahead, Mr. Wilson. So we have 18 and a half million, maybe 20 million. To, to defer capital needs on existing buildings and to buy a building downtown Rocky Mount that will not hold all the high school students. And then I can't imagine us spending $20 million on those uh, facilities at Rocky Mount and not spending the $10 million on the existing buildings in the edge home. So really we're looking at $30 million to be fair. And I doubt Y'all, the school board, did tell us this: that is there any Edgecombe County student today attending a facility not owned by Edgecombe County? I can't imagine building out an educational program where we're sending kids to facilities that we do not have in our control. Whether it's leased or owned, but not in the goodwill of others just to hand it to us. So we need to factor that cost in too. So the thirty million number is not everything. And that that's just facilities. That's not counting transportation costs and other things. Um, which is an argument that is made to us, okay, in terms of whether we're going to uh, proceed uh, with the diversity issue. Okay, that means to us, those of us on the county board, uh, uh, in terms of, I think we are making inquiries as to uh, some help from uh, state and federal sources in terms of. I want to, let, let me back up one thing too. When Rocky Mount High was built, wasn't it about $38 million? 43. 43. 43. So $43 million was spent on Rocky Mount High. 33%, 33% of the students who attend Rocky Mount High are Edgecombe County students. But we only pay 12%. So that means Nash paid $10 million more for the benefit of Edgecombe County students. So we have to keep that in mind too. We're talking about the Red Oak and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we're talking about 11 or 12 percent because that's kind of what started the conversation early on. We're having to send 11 or 12 percent because there's a new Red Oak school. To build well, we have a short term memory though when we realize that they paid for uh, all of these Edgecombe County students to go to a brand new high school. We only had to pay 12 percent, even though 33 percent of the students are Edgecombe County residents. So we just got to keep that all in mind. We got with that all in mind. We've got four schools that we're considering with the Edgecombe County students in this building. And so when we look at what we need to do for those students, they're not getting the human resources of being ranked in those schools. And they're never going to get it either our children. And they look like me. We have failed, and we continue to fail if we don't do that. That's going to be our responsibility here. And in the next I would be asking this board as to whether they're going to pull the 
concentrate on that. And I'm hoping that I can get some more strong support through that. I think the question, we can make the decision to pull the trigger. It can be two, two years ago. I think that the school board will help us determine when it can happen. And we can tell the, the, the kind of manager at any time to make the decision two years down the road, it can be three years down the road. It can be when we have decided that we have put the resources in place to make this happen. So is this your contention that we're going to improve the quality of life of these 60 yes, or 64 students? And how do you think we're going to do that? I think they're going to be better educated. Okay. Much better educated in a quicker time frame. We have looked at those students are failing and nothing is being put in there. And these are our students. The county is our responsibility. I don't, I don't think we've looked at the, 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 the money that's going to be coming back to this system. I don't think we've got the entire ticket on Can I address that? Yes, sir. I saw a comment in the public newspaper that $10 million would be plenty of funding for the students coming back to this county, which is crazy. There's no way the funding coming up to these students because of the ADM figures are going to cover what we bring them back over here. When you're looking at figures here, in 2020, $43 million. I bet you can't build that school today for $55 million. But that's the recent figures we have. And you can go up right on down the line. How many people will go, if we made the old post office of school, what's the maximum amount of students that can be put in there? Period. We've been talking about it, but nobody said. How many students can be put in there? Can anybody answer that question? Well, I think that um, in terms I get that, but I'm trying to find at least a figure of people that it could hold in a bit worse or best conditions, whatever you want to call it. Nobody has said that we, figure. Just yeah, really, if all the kids right now want to go down approximately like 250 students, and there's a factor in 150 new students that were anticipating to go with the Rockefeller. We also need to make a pledge as well that if we want to improve their education and we feel like they're not getting a good education from the state of North Carolina, but we're only responsible is that we have to pledge that we would not hire any NASH teachers who currently teach today because obviously they must, must, must not be good teachers. I, I don't think we can make a pledge. No. <laughs> I mean, if, if, it's the same, if we do nothing but hire the same teachers to teach in the same classrooms, the same kids, then we've got the same results. I think probably the question now is, is, is uh, in terms of those schools and the uncertainty uh, what's going to happen with them. And so I think the problem is uh, a, lot of, a lot of people don't want to necessarily go there because they don't know if work is going to happen because they might be out of a job. So, so they really don't know what's going to happen to them. So I think that's an issue. I don't think it's my intent to state that the teachers were, are not qualified, but I think the most experienced resources are put in other schools. Okay? I think that. So I don't I'm not saying, making that statement that they're disqualified. I don't think, to me, um, to, it doesn't make, I cannot accept any uh, position that would help me understand why we, this board, are not performing statutory responsibility. And the statutory responsibility of making sure that we educate our children in our county. And the children that are in this no man's land that are being denied. And we have an opportunity here to pull that trigger, okay? And I will be still be asking this for we can make arguments, we can make arguments for all again. And it's not necessarily in this need that we I think it's a need between us on, in terms of at our needs. And I and as I stated, I will be putting it on the gentleman and we Make these arguments that I'll need for or against in terms of the need that we hold. But it's our job. We find money to do everything that we need to do. We find money to, we've got an uh, economic development site at Kingsburg that we put, we find money when it's requested to put there to make that happen. Uh, 
So it depends upon where we put our priorities. That's where we just would put our priorities. clarification on one thing. So we're going to offer whatever you want to call it, to grandfather some students that they may stay in the Rocky Mountain system. What's the terms of that? Are you a senior, a junior, or a sophomore? Yeah, so we talked about having K-8 students come over and having high school students stay. That was an option. Mm -hmm. And then they would stay in graduate school. Yeah. 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 Y
under their current traditional, most likely, program of education. I'd like to know, just like Mr. Bobway asked, what the grades are per school in Nash and what the grades are per school in Edgecombe and get a weighted average based on students, based on, on the total district, to see if their, if their way of educating the whole of Nash is a subpar way of educating, since we think we can do so much better than Nash does today. Does that make sense? I mean, if, if Nash and their program is failing our kids, why is it only failing the kids that are Edgecombe County residents and not failing all the kids that are Nash County residents? And, and, and they're not just doing that. You can look, the State Department has, uh, it, it's, it's public knowledge that they are, uh, for what they've done over the years, uh, it's published. And we don't know where they're at. Well, I'm just curious why, if, if their whole system is not doing well, because they use the same program in all of their schools, most likely. I, I don't know. I've not heard that the whole system was not doing well. I would only speak what I think, and I mean that is that the is that for as a matter of record, the schools that are serving our children in the Edgecombe side of them. I'm just saying that whatever program they're using to successfully educate children that may not be Edgecombe County residents, I wonder why our kids are not succeeding at the same rate as the others. I, I, I think maybe it's some of that is is is. Is maybe we have an innovative approach to serving our kids of who probably don't. Just for clarity, uh, is it or is it not true that any low performing school, any students in either system, this is the state, uh, can choose what school they go to? I mean, if you you don't have to go to a low performing school, you have the option to go to. Any school. Is that correct? Within their county. In their county. In their county. Okay. So in this situation here, there may be students on the edge side who choose to still go or in the, you know, in the, the top of the city high school right, right. They can still go to an edge county. Correct? Because we have students in edge county that are attending, according to this data, the Nash County Right? Well, I think, okay. let me see if I can tell They're still in the same school system. Right. If they come across here, they're in a different school system. So that's a whole, that, that's a level process. That's, going to be that, that's a whole school board issue in terms of where they got to get accepted and those kinds of things. So I, I, don't, I don't see it happening exactly like this, but I think the, the major question for us. Okay. okay. And the reality is, okay. it's going to count and it's going to count. So many years, we've done it a certain way. In order for us to move out of the hole that we're in, we're going to have to open our vision. These children belong to us. We're going to have to make the best decisions. Everybody's talking about money now. You know, that's just the bottom line. But if you're going to keep putting the obstacles in the way, we can never move forward. The thing of it is, all we can do is present the data that these folks have been collecting and show you that basically, based on where we are, we cannot stay there. I'm 75 years old, and it's been, you know, everything changes. We are reimagining, or re it's a new normal coming about. So if you can just, um, if you can take away the obstacles that you see, and here's some of the positive things that can be, I think we might arrive at the same place. We all have different opinions, but please, 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 I graduated from Edgecombe County School. I don't think it turned out bad. But we got to really realize that we're in a new day, and we're gonna to have to look at it realistically, and dollar signs, yes, are important. But what we're really talking about, the children, think about these children belong to us, we're gonna to have to make the best decision that we can based on the data that we have. We don't know all of the answers, and you all have some good questions, but don't, don't abandon it before you really hear those of us who've been in it, and y'all can say what you want to. We've done, but we've done pretty good in Edgecombe County. 
We've educated children well as well. But when you start comparing, I, 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 I caution you to stop comparing if you don't have the actual numbers. And let's talk about the what is. What is, we have students on the Edgecombe County side that we're trying to make the best decision. Is every, every, point, every decision gonna be good? No. But we're gonna, if, we, if we put our minds in a positive manner and say, let's see if we can all get on the same page, at least get on the same page to begin with, but with the data that we have, I think we can probably kind of slowly walk it through. And I think sometimes we may be seeing the same thing, but dollar signs might be pushing us left or pushing us right, which I know is important. But just, just keep in mind, these children, we've got to make a decision. And you, for every plus, you can find a negative if you want to. But if we could really please just stand still and just really realize these are our children. What is the best solution that we can come up with in this room? Everybody didn't come from the same place, so we all got different opinions. But let's, let's bring the opinions together and begin to say, let's see how we can do it. And as we look at that, we can stop taking all the, uh, this gonna happen, this gonna happen. That's gonna come up anyway. But if we all start on the page of, we're talking about real children that we gotta make a decision about, let's all own those children and do the best thing that we can to make sure that we make sure every child is educated as best we can. I think Dr. Bridges has some more slides that she needs to do. There's a few more. Um, you all finish up the rest of the slides. Sure. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, you all just alluded to some additional dollars that would follow the students if they did come to Edgecombe County Public Schools. And so just wanted to quickly touch on that. So uh, PCPS will receive an increase in time on federal funding, state funding, in addition to any local funding that you all would allocate. And then of course, we seek to raise additional federal and state grant funding and philanthropic funding to do some of the work that you heard about tonight. And so just a few numbers to put up here. So you can see the current Title I federal funding allocations that the schools in Rocky Mount that we're discussing receive this year. And so this totals to about $472,000 uh, that these schools are receiving in Title I federal funding to support their academic programs at those schools. In addition, this is, uh, this is data from 1920, but in that year, about $6,652 was allocated per pupil in Nash County Public Schools. So if we multiply that times 1,644 kids, that's nearly $11 million in state dollars that would come to Edgecombe uh, to help us educate these students. And then finally, we certainly see additional funders to support this work as well. Um, you can see some examples up here of some funding that's been raised in Edgecombe County Public Schools, nearly $2 million to support the work of the North Phillips School of Innovation. It's come from local funders, but also from national funders um, who have been inspired by this work and supported the work that you've heard about over the past few years. And then we just listed a few of the other grants that we've received from various sources. So uh, from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, we $230,000 in grant funding just for the summer. Uh, some smaller grants from uh, some other funders like Teach for America. We have a $500,000 Learning Hubs Innovation Grant that's supporting work at Princeville West and North right now. And then our Scholar Teacher Scholarship Fund, which we have over $800,000 committed for those students. So again, just sharing some of that um, track record that Dr. Johnson spoke of. Uh, and of course, we continue looking for dollars like this to support our Rocky Mountain students if they were to. And now, this is Mr. Evans' slide, so pass it over to Evan. And so, just quickly, I wanted to revisit. You've seen this uh, formula calculation. This is updated for next uh, fiscal year of how the gap funding is calculated. Um, you com we compare what Nash County uh, projects to a lot to the schools uh, for the coming fiscal year. Take the number of students. That's and that's the NASH per student uh, allocation. Uh, then we look at what Edgecombe plans to uh, appropriate 2.1 million. As a note, this number right here, we'll see it in just a second, has not changed in several years. So that number right there is the number that our board has some say so. You, you vote on this number um, with, with your budget. And, and, and by the way, these number of students based on last school year, the ABM for actually current school year, um, and then that's the per pupil allotment from income, and that's the difference, the gap, as, as we call it. So you take that gap and multiply it by our number of students, 
And so that gap is uh, this coming year a little over five hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So I want to show you, and this is the gap we were just talking about here. Um, so this right here in twenty twenty one. Um, that's when we had to take over that gap from City of Rocky Mount per Senate Bill 382. Uh, you'll see that there's a, a, almost $100,000 jump here in, in the gap for this upcoming year, and that's because, as has been mentioned, uh, next kind of board of commissioners have indicated they plan to give additional funding to raise the supplement by one percentage point. And, uh, and so because of Senate Bill 382, then we have to pay that regardless of what it is. So if Nash County decides it, to raise it 2% or 3% or whatever it might be, um, Senate Bill 382 does not give us any veto of that. Um, you can also see here in this section, this is the annual uh, capital. So each year we look at what the annual capital appropriation, that is the amount that's given to do repairs or what have you for that year. Also for debt service, that includes uh, some debt that's been on the books for some time, uh, like uh, the Rock Mount uh, High School, as well as some new debt that uh, just recently come along with the uh, uh, Red Oak Elementary School. And that's what our total debt is. So you can see what uh, the county has been sending over to Nash County uh, in you know since 1819 and so you know again from from my perspective the difficulty is as I'm working on the budget and I look at what the request is from Edgecombe school system and we have to make a decision as to are, are we able to fund what they have requested like last year um, they requested nine hundred and some thousand dollars above what we were able to give we gave the same amount as we did the previous year with the exception of the additional hundred thousand dollars to cover the new position. And so um, we, ha we have the ability to say yes or no, but because of Senate Bill 382, we don't have that ability um, when it comes to uh, Nash County schools. And, and so I guess the only place I would leave it is that I think we, we've heard some, at least two things here that's somewhat concerning, and, and whether or not the merger is the fix for it is for, as for our board and the collaboration with the school board to decide. Uh, this funding, Senate Bill 382, that, that's a challenge for us, I believe. And we, we talk about that uh, in, in some great deal. And I think you've also seen and heard tonight some concerns about those four schools and the performance. So, um, you know, obviously this is, a, this is a huge decision for the board to make. Um, to, whether you choose to do it or not do it has, I think, ramifications in both ways and both directions. And, and certainly, I, I hope that we together have provided with you uh, a lot of good information for you to make as informed a decision uh, as you possibly can. So that's where we're we'll leaving it. Um, certainly, if there are questions that you have that were not answered tonight, either by myself or by our friends of the school system, we certainly will be happy to either try to answer those or at least jot those down and, and return at some point very soon to answer those questions. So, yes, ma'am.
And that same individual, after they got the money in their pockets over there, decided to vote with the majority of her board to spend it on that new Rocky Mount High School that everybody's talking about. And uh, Mr. Evans, have we finished the bond? Have we finished paying that bond out? No, ma'am. See what I'm talking about? They got that money. And that needs to come back. That, that amount needs to come back. You've you got to remember, though, 33% of the students who attend that $43 million school is $15 million we should have sent. And as you just said, we only sent them three and a half. Well, we won't so we, they, actually, they actually gave 10. I keep saying that. They we probably want to ask enough. for us to give Maybe them 10 million. Maybe we cannot send enough. But we sent according to what we raised. Right, but I mean, maybe we, need to send, maybe we need to send uh, Nash ten more million dollars. No, we don't need to send Nash anything. We don't need to send We got a deal. Anything. We got a deal. Well, no, no, we got one kid in the middle. We still can't wait for say. See what I'm talking about? But you got, we got 33% of Rocky Mountain. You got what we lose. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Look at all the other schools. Do the math. The math is something. Well, uh, <laughs> it's cheap, it's cheap, it's cheap. No, if $43 million was spent in a high school and 33% of the students are Edgecombe County residents, then we should have paid 33% of $43 million, but we didn't. We only paid 12%. What that didn't take is that the state gave them $20 million on the top. They all had, they all had to do is $20 million. The state gave them $20 million. I do. <laughs> the state gave them 20 They only had to pay 20 million. Well, out of all the conversations you hear, yeah, I think the solution to it is in You know, this issue has been going on all my life in terms of. 21 years. Of, uh, of, uh, That's how long it's been going on. school system journey. It's been a point. And I think the next county has shown us that. The, the bill that we put create to the bill, yes, sir. It named, it changed the name of the school system from Rock from, from that part right, to that kind of school system. They withdrew out of the Gateway Park District. So they have said to Edgecombe County, we want no relationship with you. And we have a commission that says we need to send them some additional money, that additional money that we uh, so I'm saying to those of us that we got the, the, the authority to do it, I'll be asking Mr. Evans to put it on the committee. Can we do it in this discussion and this issue, which has plagued this region for all of my life?
And when if we demerge, you have driven the last nail in the coffin to separate the city of Jesus. The final nail, that'll be it. I've lived in this county my entire life. I've watched the buildings go down. I have three children that have lived in the county public schools, all who are very successful. But this is the last nail in the coffin to do this. You have separated us forever in every respect. We won't just be a railroad. Everybody will be separated. It's a lot more than kids. It's a lot more than money. But it's a great part of it. We don't need any more separation. I don't agree. That's my final comment. And I, and I, I don't agree with you. That's fine. You just have to be the nail. I don't agree with you. The, 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 the Senate Bill 382 goes to the nail and it's the Senate man. <laughs> and it put us in this position. That's right. We got an option. And the option is ours. That's right. If that nail. Separates us. I'm going to try to drive. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Um, I really have to turn it on that. I'm that Dr. Bridges can handle whatever I believe that the children, as you said, they're Hickson County children. I want them to stay in their neighborhood school. I want those schools to belong to Hickson.